Anybody grateful for Jesus this morning? Come on. Not just a golf clap, but anybody realize, come on, you wouldn't be awake this morning. You wouldn't be alive. Anybody realize that Jesus rescued us, come on, from sin, from confusion, from our own crazy mistakes. Uh, I love Jesus, and I love God's church. Uh, so excited to be with you guys. Uh, Pastor Jeff, thank you for having me. Thanks for allowing me to stand in your pulpit on a Sunday and preach to the big folks, preach to the adults. Anybody ready for the word today? Come on, anybody ready for the word? Man doesn't live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So I'm ready for the word this morning. I got a word for you. And uh, I'm black. <laughs> uh, I'm black. And so that means I grew up preaching at black churches. Everybody say black church. Black church, okay? And there's no confusion when you're preaching at a black church as to whether or not you're doing a good job or a bad job. There's no, like, ambiguity. There's no, nothing's unclear, okay? You know whether or not you're doing a good job or a bad job when you're preaching at a black church, okay? If you're doing a bad job, everybody say bad job. If you're doing a bad job, bad job means that your jokes aren't funny. Bad job means that uh, what you're saying is, you know, not inspired by the Holy Ghost. What you're saying, you're, you're taking Bible verses out of context. If you're doing a bad job, that means you're boring, okay? If you're doing a bad job, bad job, uh, one of the church mothers, typically sitting in this section right over here, one of the church mothers, okay? If you're doing a bad job, one of the church mothers will stand up and say, help them, Holy Ghost. <laughs> kid you not if you're doing a bad job and sometimes you can be doing so bad that you agree with her prayer like holy ghost yes please help me i need you right now uh i need a double portion of your anointing on my life or i need you to i don't know uh help me to teleport out of here whatever you need to do um however who if you're doing a good job everybody say good job a good job. That means your spiritual antennas are working. You are hearing from heaven and delivering a word to God's people. That means you are animated and, and you are entertaining and revelatory at the same time. That means words are just kind of flowing out of your mouth and the Holy Spirit is taking control. If you're doing a good job, that same church mama that would have clowned you the week before, that same church mama will stand up on her feet and look at you like something stank. That same church mama will act like she's on the front row of an NBA game. That same church mama, typically wearing a doily cap on the top of her head, will look at you and say, you better preach, boy. Let's go. Amen. Make it plain. Say that for the folks in the back. And my favorite thing that a church mama says is take your time, preacher. Take your time. So here we go. We're going to make an agreement today. We all black. Everybody in the room, you all black. Everybody black today. Okay, you all black, and here's the deal. I got 23 minutes and 19 seconds. We're gonna make this agreement. If you, <laughs> there we go. You promise to act black, I will promise to act white, and I'll get you out of here in 23 minutes <laughs> and 18 seconds, because the church I grew up preaching at, we preach for 99 minutes and 99 seconds, okay? Uh, so uh, I, I will get us out of here. On time, I'm wondering if anybody had a mama like mine. Um, my mama used to say things like, if, if I was crying and she felt like I was crying for no reason, she would say, if you don't stop crying, I'm gonna give you something too. We had the same mama, that's crazy. <laughs> we had the same mama. Uh, and I, I was a youth pastor for years and years and years, and I used to say to my young people, uh, if you act bored while I'm preaching, I'll give you something to be bored about. I will bust out Deuteronomy in a heartbeat, okay? We'll start reading through Levitical laws, okay? Don't play with me, okay? If, if you hear the Holy Ghost speaking, come on, you say amen. We're, this is a church. This is a participatory experience. Why? Is it just to make a preacher feel good? No. It's because the power of life and death is in your tongue. The moment you begin to say amen, you're saying, so let it be. I believe by faith that what that preacher's talking about, I can access it by the power of my words. If the preacher's preaching about faith and you know you're struggling with doubt, that's a good time to say amen. If you know, and it's a great time to play everybody, because here's, here's the deal. As long as you say amen, nobody believes that's what you're struggling with, okay? So that's a joke. Uh, so I want us to be participatory. I want us to dig into the word. We had an amazing time with the young people. Man, I want to give away one of these confession cards. Uh, I was a youth pastor for a long time. And I wrote confession cards for my young people. But everywhere I go, adults tend to like these too. And uh, I wrote one for anxiety. It says this, uh, I have dominion over every anxious thought because I have the mind of Christ. I believe that Jesus is the Prince of Peace. 
I've crowned him as the prince of my life. Therefore, I expect to walk in his peace. God has given me authority over all things, but not control over all things. I refuse to worry about what I cannot control. I'll be present today. I will rejoice today. I will live in today without worrying about tomorrow. God has placed eternity within my heart. Therefore, I will not worry about what is temporary. Only those things which impact eternity will grip my heart today. Anxiety is proof that I am creative. I will not use that creativity for my destruction, but rather my destiny. If I can meditate on the problem, I can meditate on the solution. If I can imagine negative outcomes, I can imagine positive outcomes. I'm taking authority over my mind and my heart. I am anxious for nothing. Uh, I wonder if there's anybody in the room you struggle with anxiety. Would this be a blessing to you? Anybody, anybody. You raised your hand. I saw you. There you go. It's all yours. Uh, I uh, love writing confession cards. Uh, those are at our table. I think they're nine bucks. Are they nine bucks, Sam? If you know somebody that struggles with anxiety, grab it for them. If you struggle with anxiety, grab it for you. We, I, I love writing confession cards. Come on, because the power of life and death is where? In our tongue. In our tongue. Got so many people who put that on their mirror in their bathroom and say it every single morning. And guess what? Over the course of 30 days or 45 days, guess what? We begin to gain authority over anxiety. Can I preach a little bit? Can I, can I push a little bit? Uh, the, the enemy scheme is to make you believe that your authority is in your thumbs. But authority is not in your thumb, it's in your tongue. Which means you can't text the devil away, boo-boo. You cannot tweet the devil away. It don't matter what you type to a friend. No, authority is in your tongue. And I tell teenagers all the time, we have a generation that's so much more comfortable using their thumbs than their tongues. And it's the scheme of the enemy to try to get you silent and quiet. So we, I write confession cards to help people to get the word, not just in their heart, but out of their mouth, all right? So uh, come to the table. I'd love to hug you and shake your hand and, and give you COVID fist bumps and all that good stuff, whatever you're comfortable with, all right? Let's get into the word. We're going to go to Matthew, Matthew chapter 15. If you've got a physical Bible, go ahead and grab it. I'm going to be reading from the NIV, uh, Matthew chapter 15. Super, super excited to get into the word. We're going to talk about faith, okay? We're going to talk about faith. Everybody say faith. I'm going to talk about faith, all right? Uh, it's important that we talk about faith because the Bible says that we are saved by grace through Okay, that was 14 of you. By grace through faith, all right? So that means we're on a lifelong journey of faith, a lifelong journey of faith. I know so many believers, they're in a faith fight versus cancer or a faith fight with infertility or a faith fight to be the first person in their family to break generational strongholds, and they think that the faith fight is over when they kill that Goliath or when that wall falls down. But guess what, baby? As soon as that faith fight is over, guess what starts? Another faith fight, okay? As soon as that giant falls, guess what you have? Another giant after that. Can I tell you one thing? Your faith journey is never going to end. Never going to end until you meet Jesus, okay? We are going to be in a fight for faith, a fight of faith for our entire lives. In Hebrews 11:6 6 says this, and without, it is impossible to please God. Oh, y'all know the Bible. I love this church. And without faith, it is impossible to please God. You know, sometimes in church, we make it seem like, and without faith, it is impossible to get a miracle. Or without faith, it is impossible for God to bless me. But can I tell you something? Even when you have faith and the intended outcome does not happen, that does not mean that your faith was wasted. It means that your faith still pleased God, even though what you were believing for did not happen. You were believing God for healing and that person didn't get healed. Guess what, baby? Your faith pleased God. You were believing God for financial breakthrough and you called him Jehovah Jireh and the financial breakthrough didn't come. Your faith wasn't wasted. You don't look stupid. You don't look foolish. Oh, no, get out of here. With that your faith please God we've got to get back to the point where we stop having faith for things and start having faith to please God I've got faith because it pleases God and I am gonna act like he's God God you are God and like the three Hebrew boys I'll say I know you have the ability to do this but even if you don't. I still ain't going to bow down, Nebuchadnezzar. I'm still not going to doubt God. I will be consistent. I will be strong. I will be persistent. And I want to push us a little bit because a lot of folks, uh-oh, woo, we got Ikea furniture faith. Don't act like you ain't never bought something from Ikea. 
My wife loves buying stuff from Ikea. <laughs> my wife loves buying stuff from Ikea, and it takes me 38 hours to put this stuff together. <laughs> loves buying stuff from Ikea. And you know what? The thing about Ikea is that, you know, it looks great. It's cute. But the moment you move from one place to the next, you put a dresser into a box truck, next thing you know, you got a, 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 a pile of dust. Because although it looks good, it cannot sustain any kind of impact. We have a lot of people in church with IKEA furniture faith. You got faith as long as there's no pandemic. You got faith as long as nothing goes wrong. You got faith as long as you're employed. You got faith as long as you're blessed. You got faith as long as don't nobody go to the hospital. But what good is faith without a struggle? The reason we need faith is for the hardest seasons of our life. The purpose of faith is to actually walk through suffering, to walk through darkness, and to say, my faith is stronger after the battle than before the battle. My faith is not for the mountaintop. My faith is for the valley. Is there anybody in church this morning who's like, that black man is preaching, and I'm going to say amen. Give me a good amen right there. Faith. We got a lot of people with cute faith. Fragile faith. I mean, fragile faith. <laughs> it's cute. It looks nice. But the moment you walk through tough stuff, your faith just disintegrates. So we got to talk about faith. And I love this because we're going to talk about two women. Okay, two women. All the ladies say amen. We're going to talk about two women this morning. We're going to go to Matthew 15. We're going to talk about this Canaanite woman. Matthew chapter 15. And this is one of my favorite stories in the Bible. And this story doesn't get preached about enough, but we're going to deal with it today. And we can put it up on the screen. Matthew chapter 15, verse 21. It says, leaving that. Oh, come on. Call and response, okay? If I, if I don't say a word, that means it's your turn to say that word because that's how we read the Bible, okay? Leaving that, Please. there we go. Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon. A Canaanite woman from that vicinity came to him crying out, Lord, son of, have mercy on me. My daughter is demon-possessed and suffering terribly. Uh-oh. Jesus, is that what I think it says? Jesus did not answer a word. See, we got to talk about rude Jesus today, okay? Jesus had his headphones in. Jesus had his AirPods in, okay? The woman, I, I need you to get this. The woman says the right thing. The woman has a worshipful attitude. The woman says, the, Lord, Lord, not homeboy. No, Lord, son of David. Have mercy on me. Anybody crying out today, I need you to have mercy on me. God, I'm not asking for this because I deserve it or because I've earned it. No, I need you to have mercy on me. She comes with humility. She comes with a worshipful attitude. She comes with a praise. She comes and, 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 and she comes with a selfless request. She wants something for somebody else. Is there anybody in the room today? Come on. You're like that. You're saying, God, I'd rather my daughter be blessed than me. I'd rather my son be blessed than me. I'd rather my grandbabies be blessed than me. I'm praying for the next generation. I'm praying for my brother who doesn't know Jesus. I'm praying for my niece and my nephew who doesn't know the Lord. I'm praying. So I'm praying with a worshipful attitude. I'm, I'm praying because I, I want God's mercy to be bestowed. I'm praying selfless. Uh-oh. And Jesus still ignored you. I hope I'm preaching to some real people in Iowa. Has anybody ever, you prayed the right prayer, you said the right thing, you checked your motives, and you still feel like God ain't saying nothing back to you. Now, for all the perfect people who you get an answer from God every time you pray, you are now dismissed. <laughs> you can leave the service. But come on, for anybody that has ever walked through real disappointment, real discouragement, times where you've looked at God and said, I don't understand how you're blessing them and not me. I don't understand how you're showing up for everybody else and it seems like you've abandoned me. Come on, can we be real today? Jesus does not answer a word. He says nothing to the woman. Can I let you know something? If you feel like God's been silent towards you, can I tell you this right now? You're not alone. You're not alone. You're not the first person who's ever felt like, I can't hear God and I don't know, when I pray it just feels like I don't get a response from him. You are not alone. Just because you're not alone doesn't mean you can give up, though. Because here's what the woman does next. I love this. The disciples came to him and urged him, send her. For she keeps, she keeps, she keeps crying out after us. 
He answered, I was only sent to the lost sheep of Israel. Uh Uh-oh. The text told us that he's talking to a Canaanite woman. And he says to the woman, I was only sent for the lost sheep of Israel, a.k.a. get to the back of the line, boo-boo, because you are the wrong ethnicity. Hello. You are a Canaanite. I came for Israelites. Uh, You missed the heavenly lottery. (laughs) You were not born an Israelite, so I cannot do anything for you. Okay, here we go. I don't know if anybody's ever been around or seen a YouTube video of an ethnic minority being upset because something racist happened. It ain't cute. Ethnic minorities, uh, it's people like me. We have a tendency to uh, uh, exhibit explosive anger (laughs) when we feel like something is unjust or unfair or prejudiced against us. I wonder if there's anybody who's ever felt like, God, you've treated me unfairly. Oh, 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 okay. okay. Not y'all. Y'all are perfect. (laughs) But me and my crazy people in North Carolina, let me tell you about them. (laughs) Have you ever reminded God that you tithe? Anybody? Nobody? Just me? Okay. Just, okay. Me and you. There we go. I got one got we, right here. Like, God, uh, I remember me and my wife, we were struggling with infertility. We had a miscarriage. And I remember saying to God, your word says that if I'm a tither, I'm not supposed to go through this. And I remember God being like, boy, I wrote that book. Don't you dare tell me that I'm treating you unfairly. Are you crazy? You better sit down and shut up. Like, has God, have you ever gone to God with a serious complaint? Like, God, this is not fair. This just ain't fair. This is not fair. I played by the rules. I did what you told me to do. This is not supposed to be happening to me. Has anybody ever felt like Job? Oh, come on. Like, God, I walked blameless before you. Bad people are supposed to get punished. (laughs) I've been serving. I serve in, like, the parking lot. There's a special place in heaven for people who serve in the parking lot, especially when it's negative nine degrees. Jesus is Lord. I love this because at some point, come on, a lot of us, can we be real? If Jesus ignored you, you would have walked away. But the woman keeps coming after Jesus. And now not only has Jesus ignored this woman, but now Jesus has offended this woman. And at this point, a lot of us will walk away. Let's keep reading, though. The woman came and knelt before him. The woman, Jesus ain't getting rid of this woman. Jesus, not getting rid of this woman. The woman came and knelt before him. Lord, help me, she said. He replied, it is not right to take the children's and toss it to the dogs. What? what, 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 uh, Did Jesus? Did? uh, Excuse me? Did Jesus just call this woman a roof, roof, like a dog, a dog? Now, let me help you, okay? Because this is not American context. This is not, this is, we have to give context. Okay, Middle Eastern people, Jewish people, Semitic people do not have dogs as pets. Okay, we think dog and we're like, oh, you look, we name dogs, we feed dogs like healthy things, we have stores like PetSmart, we give dogs manicures and pedicures, we groom dogs, no, no, this culture, dogs don't even come inside, this is the most disrespectful thing that Jesus could ever say to anybody, you're a dog, why would I take the children's bread and give it to a dog? See, a lot of us, you may have still pursued Jesus when he ignored you. You may have still pursued Jesus when he offended you, but you would have not pursued Jesus after this. Oh, okay. Uh Uh-oh. Can I preach? A lot of times, you think you're asking God questions. But can I tell you something? He's the one asking you questions. Because the devil's not the only one who knows how to push your buttons. Did you know that God also knows how to push your buttons? And the moment you begin to ask God for healing or God, ask God for breakthrough or ask God for provision, he begins to respond to try to figure out how bad you really want what you're asking him for. And if you walk away when he ignores you, you don't really want it that bad. And if you walk away when he offends you, you don't really want it that bad. And if you have the audacity to walk away when he absolutely calls you a dog, then you don't really want it that bad. But there's a whole 
whole nother group of people who are willing to say, I will wrestle you all night long and I will declare, I will not let you go until you bless me. Those are the kind of people who respond with faith to say, I want this more than I want anything else. Anybody can pray. Anybody can do that. It takes a real, oh, okay, okay, uh-oh. Can, can, we, can, we, can we push a little bit? I got two people, and I brought one of them with me, so. <laughs> Remember, you're black today, okay? <laughs> can I push a little bit? There we go. Most of us approach Jesus, Jesus with our feelings, not our faith. So the moment he hurts our feelings, you walk away because you approach him with your feelings. Guess what? We walk not by sight. We walk by faith. We don't walk based on our feelings. A lot of us, uh-oh, especially the millennials in the room, we're so attached to these things called feelings. We're so emotionally aware, emotionally intelligent. No, you're just sensitive. Just stop it. At some point, you are going to have to realize that God is going to offend you. He is going to disrespect you. He is going to push your buttons. He is like a football coach. Hello. He is going to get to the root of what's actually in you. He is going to bring greatness out of you. And you are either going to cower out and sink back or you are going to rise to the occasion. And like this woman, I love this. Here's what she says. Ooh. Yes, it is, Lord, she said. Even the eat the that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus said to her, woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted and her daughter was healed at that moment. Most of our daughters would have stayed demon possessed because we would have walked away. But this woman has great faith, the kind of faith that says, if you offend me, I'm going to still be here. If you don't bless me, I'm still going to be here. I'm not going anywhere. I'm going to ask you on Monday, on Tuesday, on Wednesday, on Thursday. It can be years. I'm not going to get tired of praying. I'm not going to get tired of prophesying. I'm not going to get tired of speaking in tongues about this. I'm not going to get tired of coming up all night of prayer waking up for early no 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 i'm gonna keep knocking on the door with persistent faith with consistent faith because i'm not giving up this means too much to me great faith great faith this is what it means to have great faith now we've got eight minutes and 48 seconds all right let's do this <laughs> that is our introduction <laughs> That is the frame that we need to put the next story in. I want to frame the next story because Jesus calls this woman, woman, and he's about to call his mama, woman. That had been me. I would have got all my teeth knocked out, okay? The next story is John chapter 2. And there's a wedding. And the wine is gone. And Mary approaches Jesus much like the Canaanite woman. With faith, with honor, with respect, with a selfless request. Mary doesn't want anything for herself. She wants something for who? The bride and the groom, because she doesn't want them to be embarrassed because the wine has run out. I can imagine Mary walking up to Jesus like, hey, Jesus, uh, they about to run out of wine, and I need you to fix it. And Jesus is like, come on, Mary, this ain't got nothing to do with me. And, and Mary's like, well, you brought all your disciples. They didn't drunk up all the wine, and you brought that weird one too. What's his name, Judas? Yeah, you better watch out for him. Something wrong with him. <laughs> That's how Mary sounds in my mind. <laughs> I grew up in the hood, so everybody, people just sound like that in my head, right? <laughs> Hashtag Nariana. <laughs> okay. Mary approaches Jesus with an issue. Can we read the text? Here we go. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, they have no more wine. Verse 4. Woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied, my has not yet come. Here we go. Not only does Jesus say no, but Jesus gives a reason. This sounds like an airtight arc. This is done. <laughs> For, Jesus be saying no, but don't be giving reasons. Anybody ever been there? You just kind of like pending request. I don't know. I, mean, I have no idea why this request got denied. Jesus gives a reason. A reason. Okay. I got six minutes to do this. I didn't do this in the first service. Can we go a little deeper? Because there's only a couple different things that are going on here. Okay, let's actually explore the options. Either one, 
because Jesus ends up doing what he said he's not going to do. Everybody realize that. He did turn the water into wine. If you've been in church for like at least a year, you know. He turns water into wine. But he said he wasn't going to do it. And he gave a reason. So now we have a biblical inconsistency. This is confusing. Jesus said he wasn't going to do something, then he did it. Everybody see how this is confusing. Now we have to figure out, then what's going on? Either he was wrong about his hour and then realized, uh-oh, told Mary I wasn't going to do it. Gave her a reason that's not actually right. But we know he can't be wrong because he's the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. He knows everything that the woman at the well has done. He's a prophet. He knows everything. He's omniscient. So it's not that he was wrong or he's right, but he decided, I'm going to hook my mama up because she's my mama. But we know that can't be true. Because the Bible also says that God is, it, it doesn't show favor, that God is impartial, that God doesn't do one thing for one person and another thing for the No, no, no. God says no. I, I, he says to Cain and Abel. Remember, he says to Cain, if you do right, won't you get the same reward as Abel? So it, it can't be that Jesus is just hooking his mama up, and it can't be that Jesus is wrong, and then he corrected himself and did it. You know what it has to be? It has to be that God's will is dependent upon human will. It has to be that God actually responds to real people. It can't be that God is just fixed. And some of us have this Calvinistic uh, reformed mindset that whatever God is going to do, God is going to do. And I would contend that no, God changes his mind all the time, all throughout scripture, that God hears people interceding and having faith. And God goes, you know what? I wasn't going to do that. But just because you ask Asked me, and because you had faith, I'm gonna do what I thought I wasn't gonna do. We don't live in some fatalistic relationship with God. A lot of us act like whatever's gonna happen is gonna happen. No! When did you ever learn that? What do you mean whatever's gonna happen is gonna happen? No! People have the ability to pull heaven onto earth. We have the ability to be in a real relationship with God that is dynamic, that changes the course of history when people decide we are going to have faith. Now, I love this. Here we go. I got four minutes and 11 seconds. There we go. The people have spoken. Verse 4, Jesus gives a response and a reason. Verse 5, here we go. His mother said to the, do whatever he, what do you, wait, 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 wait a second. Most of us would have heard verse four. We would have heard, woman, why do you involve me? My hour has not yet come, and you want to know what we would have done? We would have went right back to table number 14 and sat down. And reported to everybody, I tried. Remember, imagine the conversation. Oh my God, they're running out of wine. I'm gonna go ask Jesus. You go, girl. You go, Mary. That's your son. You go. We watching. Mary goes over. Jesus, I need you to do this. Jesus says, Girl, this ain't got nothing to do with me. It's my hours not yet come. And Mary goes, Oh, dang it. Goes back to table number 14, like, Girl, I tried. <laughs> you know what we have in church a lot? And I tried spirit. I tried. You know what I tried really means? It means you didn't believe it was going to happen anyway. Uh-oh. But you went through the motions just to prove to the pastor that it wasn't going to work. Uh-oh. Oh, I'm preaching. Oh, I'm, pre I'm preaching. You're not going to amen me because it's okay. You're like, I'm stepping on your toes. You're like, dang it, you just got my pinky toe. You just. You know how many times we go through the motions? Just going, I tried. Your marriage is falling apart. And you're responding, we tried. Kids are falling away from the Lord. I tr we tried. Not effectively reaching the next generation. We tried. We got a lot of Christians that just try. Can I be real with you? Trying is not good enough. No, 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 no. So, please, trying ain't enough. Mary goes and grabs servants and some materials. Why? Because she prepared like Jesus said yes, even though what she heard was a no. Do you know what real faith looks like? Real faith prepares for the miraculous even when the miraculous looks like it'll never happen. That's real faith. Mary leaves Jesus 
in a very socially awkward scenario. Jesus has said no. And Mary's like, Pookie, Ray, Ray, what y'all doing? <laughs> Not Mary, we just working weddings on the weekends, you know, making some extra money. And she's like, I need you. Come over here. Whatever Jesus tells you to do, do you, he kind of cute. Stop talking about my son like that. <laughs> do whatever he tells you to do. And now Jesus is stuck there with Pookie and Ray Ray, <laughs> AKA servants. <laughs> Why? Because Mary has placed him in a catch-22. I know you said no. Uh-oh, can we be real? All the husbands need to say amen preemptively in advance. All the husbands, come on, on three, say amen. One, two, three. Every husband knows that what your wife says is not always what your wife means. <laughs> Please. I was married for six months before I learned this lesson. There's a difference between, yeah, I'm okay, and yeah, I'm okay. Those sound exactly the same, but they are worlds apart. What men have to learn is that women are complicated. So what they say may not always match what they mean. But do you know that men can understand that women don't always say what they mean and mean what they say, but for some reason, we wanna reduce the most complicated being in the universe down to our form so that everything he says is what he means. The reason you need discernment in a real relationship with the Holy Ghost is so that when Jesus says, why do you involve me and my hour has not yet come, what you hear is, I need to pray harder. I need to fast a little bit. I need to try a little bit more. What you don't feel is discouraged, but what you do feel is encouraged to press a little bit more and to believe that God doesn't just say what he means and means what he says, but sometimes God says something so that you will believe him more because he's testing your faith. He's testing you. He's not just the one answering the questions here. He's also asking questions. Why do you involve me? My hour has not yet come. Are you ready for God to throw you a curveball? Oh, okay, here we go. Most of us are not in a relationship with God. We are in a routine with God. So the moment God throws you a curveball, you fail every time because you've memorized answers for some test. And God goes, no, 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 you can't memorize answers for this test. The answers come from your heart. If there's faith in your heart, you won't hear doubt when I say this to you. If there's actually faith in your heart, you'll hear, I guess again, I gotta try a little bit, I gotta pray a little bit more. Mary responds in faith because there's faith in her heart. Mary hears a no, okay, here we go. Anyone who's ever been around like a college age guy or like a young adult guy, understands this kind of faith. Because a college-age guy can ask a girl out on a date, and the girl can say, no, you're ugly, and your breath smells bad. And the college-age guy goes, I think I have a shot. <laughs> I think she likes me, you know? I, th I think this can work. You know what that's called? That's called faith. That's faith. To hear a no, and to pull a yes out of it. You hear, like that's like Jehovah's Witness style. Can I come in and talk to you? No, next thing you know, they're inside of your living room. It's just like, <laughs> like persistent, persistent. Me and my wife, we've been married for seven years and the band can come up and play. We're two minutes over time. The band can come up and play. I wanna pray for us before we dismiss. Me and my wife, we were married for seven years. Two years in, we decided, hey, you know, I'm handsome. You cute. Let's have some little orangos, you know what I'm saying? The world needs cute black babies. Like, let's do this. <laughs> Amen. We started trying, no kids. A year went by, no kids. Two years went by, no kids. Three years went by, no kids. We start meeting with fertility doctors. We start meeting with specialists. And every doctor we talked to, we, talk, we had a total of five doctors. Because the first doctor told me we'll never get pregnant. And I decided I'm never going to let someone with no faith touch me or my wife. So I started to believe, God, you're just going to have to send me a doctor with faith. And I remember sitting, Dr. Walmer, I remember being in his office for the first time. 
and he looked at all the charts and he said, but anything's possible. And I said, you're my guy. In the fertility clinic, and I remember them telling me, you're gonna have to look at a sperm donor maybe, you're gonna have to look at adopting, you're gonna have to explore your options because Mr. and Mrs. Arango, it's gonna be impossible for you guys to have children. And I remember holding my wife's hand, I said, baby, I got a crazy idea. She said, you're a preacher, you always have crazy ideas. I said, we've been believing God for kids for four years, coming off five years, like, we've just been believing God for kids, believing God for kids, believing God for kids. But our life doesn't look like we're believing God for kids. We keep asking for kids, but our life doesn't look like we're ready to handle any kids. We have not prepared for a yes, even though everything we hear is a no. So we moved out of our 800 square foot apartment. We bought a house with three bedrooms. We bought a house bigger than what we needed. We went to Target. I remember buying a crib. I remember being in the baby section of Target and there was a couple in there with a baby and I remember they looked at me and said, how, how old's your baby? I said, I don't have a baby yet, but I have faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. I've got substance, I've got evidence. You know why? Because I've got faith. They looked at me and they said, what church do you go to? You know why? Because faith is attractive. Faith begins to attract people into the presence of God. Everyone wants to be around people that believe, that are optimistic, that see the glass half full, not half empty. I said, the doctor's saying it's impossible, but I'm here buying a crib because I believe by faith that God can do the impossible I put that crib in that room and every single time the doctors gave us bad news I went back to Target and bought something else I got a little diaper thing I don't even know what it does every time I would go on a preaching trip I would get, get, get in the airport I grab a onesie I got onesies from Colorado onesies from Iowa onesies from Nebraska I got onesies from all over America and guess what right now my wife is 17 weeks pregnant with a miracle baby a miracle an absolute miracle a miracle because we prepared for the miraculous when's the last time you prepared for the miraculous you say you've got faith but you're just begging God for stuff at this point faith without works is dead we have a lot of people and here's our real fear. Here's our fear. Oh, Jesus, I feel the Holy Spirit in this place. Here's our fear. We're scared that if we build an ark, it'll never rain. So we're scared of having unused arks in our backyard. But can I tell you something? I would rather have an ark that never gets used than for a flood to start and I have no ark or means of salvation to save me. I'd rather be on the other side. I'd rather play it safe, not sorry. Guess what? I'd rather, I know people with no kids and no faith. God, I feel the Holy Ghost. I'd rather at least have faith and no kids. Why would I have no kids and no faith? I told God I'll go to my grave believing you for babies. You, the devil can take kids from me, but he can never take my faith. The devil can't have my faith. You can't have my faith. You can attack my body, you can't attack my faith. You can attack my finances, you can't have my faith. You can take my health, you can't take my faith. The devil's taken so much from you. Why would you let him take your faith too? You can't control everything that the devil takes from you, but you can control whether or not he takes your faith from you. How dare you be in a relationship with God and not have faith in him? He said, God, I'll believe you to the day I die. If I never see the miracle, it's fine. At least I died with faith. I will die believing because I'm a believer. Jesus, I wonder if there's anybody in the room who you walked into church today kind of discouraged, kind of disappointed. That discouragement and that disappointment has turned into doubt. And a believer that's filled with doubt is one step away from being an atheist. It's just real. Because you believe in a God that's not actually God. You believe in a version of God that's not biblically true. He's a miracle worker. He's a way maker. He's a promise keeper. Those aren't just lyrics to a song. That is his character. That is who he is. I wonder if I'm preaching to you today. 
maybe the Holy Spirit orchestrated you to be in church today or to, for you to be live streaming and for some crazy black man from North Carolina to be preaching to activate your faith that's you doubt, discouragement, disappointment it's kind of taking root in your life and you're like God I need more faith you just lift your hand wherever you are I know I want to know who I'm praying for oh come on I see your hand see your hand oh come on hands going up all over the sanctuary can you make one more bold move with me can you stand on your feet can we just sing this out to the Lord can we worship God can we respond to the Lord by actually confessing something oh come on we're gonna say I want to see you do it again come on I've seen you move before I've seen you move mountains is there anybody in the room who's you're tired of talking to God about your mountains you want to talk to your mountains about how great your God is can you sing this out can you lift up your hands all over the sanctuary God, we take our place right now as sons and daughters and we rebuke the spirit of doubt. We declare the devil is a liar. That voice in our heads that's saying it'll never happen, they'll never get saved, they'll always be an addict, we'll always have a generational curse on our family. We say that that is a lie from the pit of hell and we rebuke that lie and we say that lie has to return to its rightful owner. We declare right now in Jesus' name, you have good things promised for us. God, you're a good father who gives good gifts. So God, we thank you that you're a healer. We thank you that you're a provider. And God, we believe by faith that whatever circumstances in our mind that we carried in here, God, you're turning it around. You're turning it around. Despite what a loan officer said, you're turning it around. Despite what a doctor said, you're turning it around. God, I pray for my brothers and my sisters in Iowa. God, I ask that right now, that Lord God, it would be done. It would be done. Last thing I'm gonna say, I'm gonna go to the lobby to shake hands and hug people. You know what took faith for this Canaanite woman? for her to leave and go home, not knowing if the miracle had actually happened. Oh. Imagine her looking at Jesus and saying, well, is there a guarantee? Is there a receipt? You'll see when you get home. And then the whole walk home, she has to what? Believe by faith. That she's gonna open up her house and there's gonna be, the daughter wasn't with her. She has to go back home. You want to know what I want to encourage you to do? Leave this room believing that it is done. Why? Because Jesus said on the cross, it is finished. Everything you're believing God for, he purchased it for you on the cross. It is finished. It is finished. It is finished. Come on. We believe in the finished work of Calvary and we declare right now, God, it's already done. It's already done. Every time we have doctor's appointments, I say, God, I'm already a dad. I look at my wife and say, you're a mom. In my Instagram bio, that don't mean a lot to y'all, but it means a lot to me. In my Instagram bio, years ago, I, I put, at Tia Rango, my baby mama. She was my baby mama on Instagram before she was ever my baby mama in real life. Because I believe she was my baby mama in heaven, hello? And we believe heaven's reality to invade earth. God, I thank you for everyone in the sanctuary. And I thank you for what you said today. We don't want anybody leaving saying the guest speaker spoke a great word no we want everyone to leave saying the holy spirit spoke to me in a deep place god do what only you can do god water the seed that was poured out today that was scattered today bring light on the word and don't let this word fall to the ground and be choked up by the enemy but god let this word produce a harvest 30 60 and 100 fold we believe you by faith for it in jesus name we pray amen